Good morning, Year 6. Sorry, good afternoon, Year 6. I hope you're well and have had a good day thus far. Today in our history session, we're going to be carrying on our investigations into World War One, And as part of that, we're going to look at how warfare had changed um, leading up to that uh, the war and therefore how the experience of being a soldier and a combatant during World War One was different. To be successful today, we need to identify how war had been conducted in the past, so in the time of Queen Victoria and previously how wars were fought. We need to check and clarify the changes in that war and we'll then need to consider how that would have impacted on the lives and the experience of soldiers, such as our poets that we're looking at within English um, and how their experiences of that war would have been different. Um, the way that war developed, we'll look at in a minute, but we'll just first of all recall some of the information we know from our previous learning. Okay, so what I've got here is some sentences. Now, each sentence has some, some, or some words. I'm going to try and move myself away just over here. The Battle of the Somme took place in northern somewhere and is often referred to as the bloodiest of all the campaigns fought during the Witch World War. Next one. And the campaign was a combined effort between Britain and France and lasted for how many hundreds of days, starting in which month in 1916, ending in which month in 1916. At the end of the campaign, it was estimated that more than one million soldiers were wounded or killed on each on both sides. Um, so we've, we've touched on the idea of million. Which country lost 623,000 men and which other country lost 500,000 men? What was, uh, where were the French fight soldiers um, fighting um, that, the, uh, that they needed relief from? Um, what was the name of the leader, the field marshal, um, who decided that he should continue to uh, get soldiers to run at the guns in spite of the fact they kept being shot as they went over the top? Um, how, how much territory, so three square what of territory had the Allies gained after the first offensive, so after the first actions of attack in the battle? Um, what kind of people were the soldiers? Were they uh, professional soldiers? Were they volunteers? Um, what, what were they called? Whose who's volunteer army were they? Um, and what was the name of that um, leader who inspired them to fight. I know that both Jeremiah and Imani have produced really effective posters trying to de uh, uh, persuade people not to enlist. So I wonder if you can identify which people uh, tried to persuade them at the time to enlist. There's some words there to fill in. So some of those words should be filled in. Some of those words are kind of red herrings. They shouldn't be included. So see if you can identify which word goes in which space. You've got this um, piece of writing as part of your pack today. Um, so try and do that as your first job, please. Once you've done that, moving on to thinking about warfare. So I've said warfare is what we were looking at the changes in. The warfare is the engagement in the activities involved in a war or conflict. We sometimes talk of a war, but warfare is almost like the, the if you think of a match in football or a season in football, that's the, the event. But playing football is the game. I'm not saying for one minute warfare is a game, but warfare is the activity, whereas the war or the conflict is the individual event. Um, uh, war we know about in terms of it's the idea of conflict. Fair is this idea of journey. Okay, so it comes from uh, Middle English, so, so maybe five or six hundred years ago, and that development of that language shows how other places, not just other languages, not just Latin, still impact on our language today. An image of those soldiers that are in those trenches, and you can see those volunteers that would have been fighting and going over the top as part of their experience of being World War One. Um, synonyms and conflict and antonym peace. I'm trying to think quite simply about simplistic antonyms and synonyms. Sometimes the simplest words that mean the same really flesh out for us what the actual core meaning of the languages. Um, having experienced horrific world warfare, which is what Wilfred Owen did, Wilfred Owen was affected by shell shock. You remember our poet whose experience of life was altered markedly based on what had happened to him in the First World War. And then he had to go back to the front and unfortunately died a week before the end of the conflict in 1918. Okay, we'll see if this video works. I'm hoping it will. If it won't, don't worry, we've still got lots of information, but we are going to now push on to finding out about the different weapons that were used by soldiers in the First World War. Let's try once more. 
Okay, unfortunately the video is not working. Sorry about that. Now, this was just showing that some of the weaponry is quite weird, as the video title says. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a close-up image of some of the pictures of the weapons, and you see if you can identify what they are and what their purpose and their impact would have been. Okay, so we'll move on. This is one of the pieces of weaponry that was used in the First World War. Any ideas what it is? What do you think? Is it part of a part of a vehicle, or do you think it's part of armor that somebody would wear on their person? Any ideas, or is it a weapon itself? Let's have a look. It's a, what's called a gauntlet dagger. Okay, it's sometimes known as a punching dagger. It, so on on somebody's arm, it was worn to allow them to go close up to somebody. So if you remember those British soldiers who were running over the top, when they were facing machine guns, they'd be expected to run at people with these on their arms so they could go at them. Obviously, they might not get there. They were very likely, as they went over the top, not to reach the point where Lord Kitchener and uh, Field Marshal Haig thought they could get to, and therefore they weren't able to make the, the attack that was successful. Next item, any ideas what this item of warfare or uh, uh, clothing would be? Okay, any ideas? What do you think, Malia? Does it look like an item of clothing somebody at war or something you'd throw at somebody? What do you think? Okay, so this is what's called a tank face mask. So when you're in, in the tank, you had to wear this mask. So think about our lives now. We're wearing masks. Ours, we, we, some of us who can wear masks complain they're uncomfortable. Some people don't want to wear them because they're uncomfortable, not just because they don't want to. Um, but this looks significantly less comfortable. It's made of leather um, and metal chain. So when uh, the hot metal that comes up off an attack on the tank, would they would be protected from them. So it's, it's performing a similar function to our mask today. It's made out of leather and metal, so it'd be quite heavy on your face, okay? But the idea is it protects your face from anything blowing up off the um, tank as your tank is attacked. What do we think to this? I can see the spiky elements on the outside, and I'm thinking they're, they're designed to inflict harm rather than as a defensive mechanism. I'm not sure what I think it is. What should we see? This is what's called a trench club. Okay, it's made of wood. Okay, so it's natural. The wood shape is natural, um, but the the spike on the end is mainly used for somebody to walk. But it also allows them, if they were in hand to hand combat combat within the trenches, or if somebody attacked them in the trench, they would have weaponry on the end. If you see the spikes on the end, and the the spike right at the end allowed them almost like that glove um, spike uh, to defend themselves as well. Okay, what do you think of this? Do we think this might be something somebody did wear in their hat, this feathered element? What do you think it might be? Again, some of these items will have been used before the First World War, but some of them, such as the tank mask, would really have only started being used in around 1910 and 1914. Okay, it's called an aerial dart. Okay, so it, it, the idea of it having feathers is quite relevant because it's this idea that it was enabled to fly. Okay, so as, as a plane was flying ahead, they dropped these aerial darts and they'd then they'd act almost like aerial bombs and they'd go down and they'd attack people from above okay so that you can see the metal elements of them and they'd hit people and hurt people uh, as they fly over them and you get these darts on your head and they'd be attacking you what do you think to these they look a little similar to masks again to be honest my, the one on the right looks a little bit similar to a boat to me um so i'm wondering if it's something like a sail i'm not sure what it might be what do you think okay this these are what's called gas clearing fans. Not so much weapons, but devices used to protect people if they've been attacked by somebody with gas. Now, there's somebody called Mrs. Hertha Ayrton, and she uh, she invented them. And the idea is there was gas around in uh, uh, in in places like craters underground. You'd waft them away almost, and the idea being that the gas, the poisonous gas, would go away. I know sometimes if something makes a bad smell, we do that. And it's a similar concept. We're trying to move the air away from the problematic region. Obviously, if it's a smell, it's just irritating. With some of these, it was poisonous gas, and poisonous gas was used as part of the war as a way of killing people. Again, this looks to me like something we'd find at Aston Hall. It looks like something from the 17th century. It looks very, very old from a civil war in Britain. In fact, it's body armor. And this was still being used in this court, this form, in 1916. Okay, but actually, this is quite modern body armor. Okay, because it was slightly lighter, so people were able to move around with it. But again, to protect people from the blows which might be inflicted upon them by the enemy. The collar and the waistcoat give you protection. 
um, so it stops the metal elements. They stop um, shrapnel, which is the broken bits of bombs hurting you. But um, if, if, a, if a bullet went at it, it'd actually make it worse because the impact of the bullet would be expanded rather than just focused on it. So it wasn't the perfect solution. It wasn't something that saved everybody's life. And then this, what do we think? Again, this looks similar to that, the officer's club that he might have walked around with and inflicted harm on people who were trying to attack him within his trench. The German trench club, so yeah. Um, this allowed people to uh, defend themselves or attack when they were within the trenches. This one's probably the most intriguing first picture. Any ideas? What do you think this might be? Okay, I'll tell you. This is what's called a periscope. And it's similar to, if you remember in our history work recently, we looked at trying to make periscopes. And it's the idea that then you could see above what was going on without actually putting your head above the parapet, without putting your head above the trench and therefore getting shot in the head. Okay, So it allowed you to look through the mirror, which is on the left-hand side of this picture, of what was going on away. I don't know if anybody managed to make a periscope. I didn't see any images of them, but it'd be great if you did. Right, guys, um, you could fold it up. That's a reason it's got the concertina metal within it so that it could go in your pocket, okay? But people had to pay for it themselves. They, the army didn't have the money to pay for these. Sort of so before, a hundred years before, in the hundred years before the First World War, when Queen Victoria was on the throne, we would have seen lots of cavalry charges, so people on horses. We would have seen people moving guns on uh, those mud, wooden wheels. This, uh, and people dying on the field with their sabres. And we still saw these sabres, uh, and, and you see in the bottom right photo where people are attacking people with swords. And that was a lot of how fighting it was hand to hand fighting. The development in World War One, though, we had the trenches we've, we've looked at, uh, we've all had this development of, of weaponry and, and that could shoot rifles that could shoot from a long distance, people that could shoot with these machine guns, multiple, many, many bullets in one minute. Also, the heavy armoury, so the, the, uh, these guns could shoot a long way and they could shoot quite a lot of uh, these large uh, devices quite quickly. We've also got the, advent, the first experience of tanks. So before then, people couldn't move across this muddy land unless they walked and therefore they were quite vulnerable to being shot. Now, up to 10 people could fit in one of these tanks and therefore they were protected to an extent. And also that meant they were unable to move across muddy land, such as where it was in the song. And we've also, as we've said, got those chemical weapons. So people started to launch chemicals and gas, and that caused people to die um, from breathing in the fumes that they experienced. Okay. And because of that gas, people started to wear protective masks and protective bibs over them to try and stop the gas affecting them. So we see again that trench warfare. We see that the experience of soldiers in those trenches, how they're fortified, so they're built up with the wood on the left-hand side, and people poke up. They want to get a shot over the top, but they don't want to put their head, because if their head is at the top, they will be shot at. We can see as well how, how, how broken the land is, people having to walk across these wooden bridges because the land becomes so muddy because of the trenches and the weather. We can see in the bottom right photo that people have these little coves, these little hollowed elements of their trenches that they dug out so that they could experience some kind of protection. However, obviously, they'd probably be sharing that space with rats, with, with mud, with filth. Okay, we'll look a bit, uh, we'll just think about common trench warfare and then we'll pause for the second video. You can see this Enfield bolt rifle. Um, you could shoot 15 shots a minute and kill somebody up to nearly a mile away, so 1,400 metres away. Um, they used these bayonets that on the end of the rifles, they had these almost like swords, so they could run and defend themselves at close quarters, so close to people. The machine guns were not main weapons for single. They, they were quite heavy, so a machine gun needed to be carried. Okay, but then these big guns like these and the ones on the bottom left needed a lot of carrying, so they needed to be moved, these artillery. These artillery were large calibre mounted field guns. Um, and they needed long range weapons that could deliver these. Uh, so, so, because it had taken so long, they needed weapons that could kill a lot of people in one minute. Okay. 